Yeah. Welcome to, to our lunch with Don today. Um, I I brought my water. That's my lunch. I I think I'm I have a granola bar, but we're glad you're here. Um, and this is meant to be kind of an open Q and A. And some of the questions that we've had over the hotline, maybe this week to just get you started, as 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 people continue to come on. But you're welcome to type in your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them over the next half hour. One of the questions that comes up to the hotline a lot, and, and by the way, if you have questions, you're always welcome to call that hotline. It's 800-276-1430. Again, that number, 800-276-1430. We can't give specific legal advice, but we can give you general guidelines and some general parameters, and we can teach you principles. The same as we do at all of our events. One of the main questions that we get is, tell me about per diem, and how do I write that off out of the corporation? It, what we're trying to do is write off um, meals, which this year and next year, um, because of the stimulus package passed by Congress, they're, they're trying to encourage restaurants, you know, and, and help build restaurants back up. And so they've, they've changed the rule from 50% deductible for business meals to 100%. That's a really good thing for businesses, especially if you reward your employees or you, you travel a lot or you, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever. But, but meals, business meals are, that's a big deal to have that 100% tax deductible. Um, and and the, the question really is about, do I take per diem well, first of all, let's kind of define that. What it's a standardized system created by Congress um, and identified, um, and you can simply look at per diem rates, standard per diem rates. Standard per diem rates will change um, depending on the city that you're at, but there's a standard per diem rate for lodging, and then it breaks down meals and, and, and incidentals a little bit differently, but because the cost of travel to New York City or San Francisco or Boston would be higher than, let's say, Kansas City or Pierre, South Dakota, $85 per night for for lodging and $115 per day for meals and incidental, as compared to maybe the standard, which might be only $96 a day across the board, um, for lodging and $55 a month for or a day for meals and incidentals. And it, again, every city will be different, but often when I travel, instead of taking all of the receipts that I have, here's exactly what I spend. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll claim per diem. I'll simply say, uh, you know what, uh, Phoenix allows $55 a day for travel. Uh, for meals and incidental, I'm going to be there for five days. So I take $220 out of the corporation. It's a full expense to the corporation. It's tax-free to me. I put the $220 in the pocket. And whether I spend that or not is irrelevant. Businesses like per diem because it helps incentivize the employees to save money. We're going to give you a standard. Here's what we're going to give you to travel. You get fifty-five dollars for this, and 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 it encourages them to eat cheaply, or to stay at a little bit less expensive hotel. And so, but it, there's there's a couple little standard rules on per diem. Um, it is non-taxable to the employee as long as you don't exceed the, the standard per diem rates allowed by the IRS. If your company is giving $75 to you per day for, for meals, and the IRS only allows in that city at that month $55, uh, that $20 extra that they're giving you would be considered taxable. Um, the, the question also comes up about per diem. Um, can I alternate? Is it an, is it an option? Um, no, it, it, it certainly is an option. Could I claim for this trip standard per diem rates and on this trip take actual expenses? Yeah, I could do that. 
There's 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 very lim very few rules, but whatever your company guidelines are, stick to them. And if you're going to say we are going to pay standard per diem rates when you when you travel, stick to those company guidelines. But if it says you know we're going to be a little loose on this, and but remember whenever you're doing meals. Um, we still have to follow all the acronym form. All expenses, whether they're meals or anything else, need to be customary for your business. They need to be ordinary for the business. They need to be reasonable and they need to be necessary. So remember that acronym corn, and, and that applies certainly to business meals, but it includes everything else. Would it be reasonable for me to go out and take a client and his wife out to dinner and spend $5,000? Um, on really nice wine, a really nice restaurant at the top of, you know, the top, you know, wherever. And would that be a reasonable expense? And, and I would say generally under most circumstances, no. But if I just signed, if the, the purpose of that meal was to sign a $10 million contract, that may be a very reasonable expense is to find, so send, spend $5,000. So it has to be reasonable for the activity that you're doing for the business purpose, just keep those little acronyms in mind. Do you need to keep receipts for all meals? The general rule is for meals under $75, you don't need to keep it. However, I like to. I, I'm, I'm kind of a personal, I'm a, I'm a paper guy. I like little pieces of paper stuck to, you know, tucked away in the file saying here's all the expenses when I traveled this trip or this month. Um, but is it required? No. Uh, I, again, receipts under $75. For meals under or over $75, what the IRS is looking for is they want to know the when, what, where, why. They, they, they want to know, and it'll be printed on the receipt, usually the, the name of the restaurant you're at and the date. But the, the IRS is wanted to see, wants to see a little bit more than that. They want to see who you were with, so who was at the business meeting. They want to see what the purpose of the business, business meeting was. We went to do a planning meeting to discuss this. Put that right on the receipt, tuck it in your file. Can you take a picture of it and, and store it digitally? Yes, you can do that. Um, and remember, most of these receipts, are, as with all records, need to be kept for three years past the time that you file the, the tax return. And sometimes maybe a little bit extra, depending on the nature of your business. I hope that answers most of your questions about per diem. Um, Kendall, was there anything else that maybe I left out? So everyone always, so you, you covered it pretty well, but everyone always says, well, we're going to lunch, we just talk business, we're good, we'll just talk business everywhere we go, every time, and that's not customary, ordinary, reasonable, or necessary, every, I mean, it's only talk business, it's not, it's intent. Right? Yeah, it, it, the purpose, the rule is, what was the reason we went to go to, I don't know, wherever we went to? Um, I mean, we went to Burger King. What was the purpose of the meeting? It, it, it doesn't matter as much whether you talked business. What was the intent of the business trip? We went because it was the only convenient time for my partner and I to get together to talk business. Okay, that's business meeting. But, uh, you know, me and my wife went out and, and uh, for dinner, it's Valentine's Day, it's our, our anniversary, and the subject came up that, you know, how's your business going? And we talked business. If I think it would be a hard sell to say on on an anniversary or Valentine's Day that 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 was the business purpose for this meeting. At least I'd be in trouble with my wife if I did that. <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell her that's our business yep. purpose. I might write it up, but I'm not going to tell her about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. All, All right. right. So next question: Are we getting any questions yet, Campbell? Okay. So Walt Walters asked: Is per diem per person? Or if two are traveling the same company, is it doubled? Oh, it would be it would be per person per day, and again, you go by the standard per diem rates, and they're really easy to find. In fact, the IRS has a free app where um, where you plug in. I don't I don't remember the name of the app, but it's easy to find standard per diem rates. And there's probably quite a few apps that are free, but it would be per person. And then be cautious and and be. Uh, 
uh, especially uh, there, there are standard per diem rates for a cruise. We, Kendall and I, we've done that on multiple occasions. We paid, let's say, $1,500 to go on this cruise. It's all inclusive. It includes all your, all your drinks. It includes all of your meals. Um, and it's a seven-day cruise. So what could we take? The NRS says you can take up to maybe this month, depending on where you're at in, in, in Alaska or where, where, where you're cruising. Look at the, at the rates. But I've seen them as high as $965 per day per person. Does that mean that I claim that? No, um, but I might push it beyond exactly what I, you know, we, we did pay the $1,500 to get on the cruise. It was all inclusive. And then maybe we took an extra $100, $150 a day um, in extra spending money. Um, and again, it, the, the purpose of this is to standardize it for the corporation. And again, the expense is an expense to the company, so it's reducing your profits in the corporation. It is tax-free to you as long as you're staying within the IRS guidelines. So I hope that makes sense. Walt says you made Linda very happy. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right, let's let's change subjects and let's talk about another topic that comes up often. Um, and it depends on who out in the nation is promoting trusts at the time. Remember, a trust is a trust is a trust is a trust, and, and there are some basic rules for a trust. They are irrevocable trusts, or there's revocable trusts. You can call them revocable or irrevocable, or whatever. Um, and and the, there's, some, there's some subtle differences and some major differences. But, but what confuses people is the marketing titles. Oh, this is a land trust. Well, okay, this is a personal residence trust. This is an AB marital trust. This is a, a charitable remainder trust. Or, and, and, and what they're doing is, is generally they're taking one or two clauses, one or two paragraphs out of the trust, and they're using that as a marketing tool to say, this is a special needs trust. Well, no, it's a regular trust. It just has a need. It, it has a special paragraph in here that that... If the event that happens here, or this is a bypass trust, or this is a, what they're doing is, is they're titling one little paragraph and, and they're marketing it as, as, I don't know, whatever they want to market it as. And I've seen, oh, this is a, this is an, I've seen really good marketing names for some of these, um, these trusts. And it, it, it's really, it's simply a trust. Somebody else holds title, at, 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 uh, somebody else, meaning the trust, owns title to an asset rather than you. Um, so for a trust, there's some, there's some basic, there's always three different parties to a trust. There's the person who creates and funds the trust. In most cases, that's going to be called the trustor. Um, it could be you know, we use different titles, but generally the person who creates and fun funds the trust is the trust or. Then there's going to be somebody that's going to run the trust. That's going to be the trustee. Now, it could be the successor trustee that took over after the original. We could call them co-trustees or single trustees or whatever. That's the person who's going to run and manage the trust. And then there's beneficiaries. And there could be initial beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries. Uh, but they're the people who receive the benefit from the trust. The, the, the major differences between irrevocable and revocable, aside from the, the fact that I can't revoke it one, once I have it, is we, we like irrevocable trusts for some things. They do offer a, a great degree, if they're drafted right, a great degree of asset protection. Because if what we're doing is we're, we're taking the asset, let's say we take a um, million dollar brokerage account and we set this aside or life insurance policy. We set that aside and we'd say we're gifting this asset. We're giving this piece of land to the trust. Um, you don't own it anymore. The trust does. Now you might receive the tax benefits. You might get an income stream. But if you get sued, you don't own this asset. And if that, that 
that is treated as a third party um, really transition and you really don't control it, then a lawsuit against you, the judgment creditor, since you can't get access to the asset, judgment creditor can't get access to it. So it does offer a high degree of asset protection and generally a, a, a revocable trust doesn't require a tax return where a irrevocable trust will. Now there's sometimes um, we, we create a living trust, that's a revocable trust, a revocable living trust that stays revocable all the days of your life. The second you die or become incapacitated, then it converts to an irrevocable trust. And now, you know, I've got to follow the rules of the trust, but, but it really doesn't, but, it does, but now it requires a tax return. Um, both types of trusts avoid probate because there's clear title to that asset after you're dead. Um, and, but the major difference is once I've created and funded an irrevocable trust, I can't change the terms. It's irrevocable. I, I, I can't go back and amend it and change it. And, and so we like, we like irrevocable trusts generally for life insurance. Um, one of the other differences is, is estate planning. Let's say right now, remember that the estate tax limit federally is around 11 point uh, something percent or 11, 11 million dollars. I think it's about 11.8 million this year. So if your estate is less than that, I don't have to pay any federal estate taxes. There might be state, but we're, we're only talking federal. So if my, if my estate is over that, but let's say I've got a $12 million estate or a $10 million estate with a $5 million life insurance policy, well, that would kick me over. And, and part of that then life insurance policy, uh, the, the, the amount that comes to us would be subject to estate taxes. Well, I don't want to lose 50% of that, that money. I want it to go to the, the beneficiaries. And so we put that in an irrevocable trust. What it does is it takes that out of my taxable estate, that $5 million policy, and now I'm only taxed on the million dollars. Oh wait, I'm under the federal exemption limit and so there would be no state taxes. So we'll use that for life insurance policies. I also see a lot of people using an irrevocable trust, let's say for a family cabin. We have a little family cabin out on Lake Michigan and I, I want this, grandpa build it and we want this irrevocably to go to our, our grandkids and our great grandkids. And, and so we create the trust we fund it or convey the property into the trust and put a little, a little money in there so that it's, you know, it pays for the maintenance, ongoing maintenance for years. And irrevocably, we want this to go to our children. But generally, at least our firm and our, our education company stays away from irrevocable trusts as much as possible when we're dealing with you know, basic family estate planning. We like the flexibility because there's so many things that happen in life. There, there, there are life events that happen that could be catastrophic. There's cancer, there's deaths, there's bad marriages. There's, there's kids or grandkids get into drugs. There's things that, that, that's going to change. And we like the flexibility of being able to change things. Um, and so, I hope that makes sense to you. But every every year or so, somebody's going to come out with this new irrevocable trust. That, oh, you can avoid all capital gains. You can avoid all taxes. You can avoid this. You, you're impenetrable to lawsuits. And, and they're sort of telling you some half-truths in, in all of this. If we put all of our assets in this one legal bubble, could something inside of that blow up the whole thing? Yeah, I've got rental properties and it's all part of my... Well, they didn't tell you about that. We like structures, limited partnerships, LLCs to hold the assets. We like corporations to manage it. We like most everything to come down to a revocable living trust that's flexible, that's amendable, that, that I can change. And as life changes and as people pass away, as people 
come into our in, into our family as a you know I like the uh, the ability to amend not file a tax return until after the, the family is um, you know the initial trustors have passed away. I, I hope that makes sense, but don't get don't get caught up in the name of the trust. Oh, this is a really good. Cool, no, that's all they're doing is taking a standard trust. They're adding a paragraph or two, and then they're titling that. Wow, this is a really cool. No, it's a trust. And whether it's a land trust that owns a piece of land or a personal residence trust that owns a personal residence or a business trust that owns a business asset or you can name it so many different things. But remember, a trust is a trust is a trust. And then we just title it after one or two paragraphs in the trust. And anyway, don't, don't get caught up in the marketing. Hope that makes sense. All right, what are the questions? So when you talk trust fund babies, those are generally beneficiaries to a correct. trust, correct? Correct. And remember that with the trust that the, the beneficiaries are the actual owners of the trust. And if they don't like what's happening in the trust, they can, they can appeal to the court to remove the trustee or put limits on the trustee. If the trustee's not doing what the trust says, now, if they don't like the terms of the trust, they don't have any control over that. Once, once the you know, grandma and grandpa have passed away, if they don't, you don't like the terms of the trust, I, I suppose you could appeal to the court and, and say, hey, I want grandma wasn't really competent when she set this up. But it, it's very rare that trusts are contested. Wills are contested all the time. Um, the, the last estimate that I got is wills will be contested 25 to 30 percent of the time. Trusts, it's pretty rare that a trust is contested and sometimes within the trust is if you contest this trust and you lose, you're disinherited. And so you can put that little clause in there. Remember that whatever you can put into a trust, whatever you put into writing, you can generally put into the distribution clause of the trust. And so if you want kids to have a scholarship fund, you can create the scholarship fund and here's the rules. And if you want the kids to read the Torah um, and go to, you know, biblical school or whatever whatever you're doing, if you want them to celebrate Mass every week before they get anything out of the trust, whatever rules you, 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 you what I really love about trust is that you can take your values, whatever they are. We value education. We value entrepreneurship. We value real estate investors. Whatever you, you what, whatever your, your values and your goals are, we can take that and we put, we put that into the trust. Or you can say, you know what, just I love my kids and everyone, when we pass away, uh, the trustees have 12 months to distribute the assets of the trust and, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm gone, no strings attached and... You, uh, we've lived a great life, here's no strings, here's all the money out of the trust. Whatever you deem as necessary, um, or it could become a legacy trust where it's not equal distribution, um, it's an equal opportunity trust. This is going to be a legacy trust, and any of our kids and descendants have equal opportunity at the assets of the trust, but you have to step up. However you create your trust, um, just know that there are some basic rules, irrevocable, revocable, and then the, the, the parties to the trust, the trustor, the trustee, the beneficiaries, follow the rules of the trust. That's what we're doing. So I, I actually had a trust fund roommate, you know, and it, it kind of ruined him financially. It was good for him on one hand and bad on the other hand, you know. That's a whole different discussion. Because he was getting so much money yeah. that he didn't have to do anything. And, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, that's a different discussion, but I like that, that you have the options to, to make that so it doesn't happen. But as far as, let's say he uh, did something, uh, you know, got an accident or something, is that how, how protected is his you know, money that he's a beneficiary of now? Well, could they could they garnish that income stream that he's getting? Yes, but the trustee, uh, there there should be in that in in the trust there should be spend thrift clauses, and hopefully, uh, which which prohibits um, people from coming in and seizing your um, your income stream or your your whatever your benefit of the trust is. We're looking, we're always looking for spendthrift clauses. Let's say our kids get into a bad marriage and 
and uh, let's say my my fourth son gets into a bad marriage, and but I I don't want half of his inheritance to go to you know his ex wife. Um, there we can we can build into that. They're called spendthrift clauses that prohibit judgment creditors, ex spouses, or somebody else that has um, maybe a claim to them from getting access to that. So that would be that would be in the drafting of the initial trust. So it's important. Yeah, it's important because yeah, you, you can very much customize, and they they are and. Mm, usually, people think uh, asset protection for a living trust, revocable living trust, usually no asset protection. Right. It, it, so let's say I, I use an irrevocable trust. So I put my home in there, and maybe I've even covered it to keep you know the equity low. Maybe my trust owns several interests in LLCs or limited partnerships. Maybe all other personal property belonging to you know me. Uh, my wife uh, fall into the trust. the The question is: is the is the revocable living trust? Does it give you any degree of asset protection? And as a general rule, the answer is no. No charging yeah. order. Yeah, right. So if, if somebody sues me, I really am the trust until I die. It really doesn't kick in. It's revocable. It's disregarded by the IRS. It's disregarded by the courts because of the fact that I can move assets in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out all I want. It's revocable. It's amendable. I have access to all those assets. As a result of that, then a judgment creditor also has access. This is this is one of the benefits of an irrevocable trust is I don't have access to it. If I don't have access to it, a judgment creditor doesn't. Now, one of the selling points of irrevocable trusts is yes, you're going to have a third party trustee, but you can always ask for money. You you can always you can you you can manipulate this guy and just just tell him what you want, and he'll give it to you. If it's that easy, then it's really not an arm's length transaction. And what we see, um, especially in offshore trusts, which are often irrevocable, uh, we we see well, okay. As all you have to do is ask the trustee and he'll give you money, yep. Then ask the trustee, no, sir, I won't. And and what they do is the judge will throw the guy in jail and says, until you <laughs> pull money out of the trust, if, if it's that liquid, if, it, if there's that much flexibility built into the trust, there's really no asset protection. If you have access to those trusts and, and the assets in the trust, then the judgment creditor the, the, the beauty of an irrevocable trust, and the only reason that it's irrevocable is because I gifted the, the asset, I, I have the income stream, I get the tax benefits, I have to follow the rules of the trust. But if you can break the rules of the trust anytime you darn well please, it's not irrevocable. And the courts often will, will break into irrevocable trust because of the flexibility that you build into to, to a trust and then try to call it irrevocable. Yeah, and that doesn't work. Right. Interesting. That's what other why questions we, do we have? That's why we don't use irrevocable trusts a lot, too, because you can't change them either. So it's tricky for estate planning, asset protection, and things change in life. It's going to change. Yeah. Now, if you have an asset um, that irrevocably is never going to change, this is going to, the life insurance policy is going to go to, okay, then irrevocable trust. But, but as the estate planning limits have, have risen, the exemption limits have gone up and up and up. You remember, they used to be at six hundred and seventy thousand dollars twenty years ago. That's going to change to a million. Well, yeah, no, no, who knows what, it's gonna, what Congress is going to do yeah. with that exemption limit? They're talking about it. Yeah, it's, it, every political campaign is always going to talk about that exemption limit. I mean, let's say it comes back down to five million dollars, which it was at one point, and now my state is over that we're going to see a lot more irrevocable trusts. Not because people like them, it's because it takes that asset out of my taxable estate. And it takes that life insurance, it takes that property, it takes that business, it takes something out of my taxable estate. And we're trying to avoid generally anything over that limit. The estate taxes federally will take about 50%. And so we're, we're trying to save the estate and let it go to the kids. Um, and not go to the government. And so you'll see if that limit goes back down and, and drops back down to a million or five million or whatever, you'll see a lot more irrevocable trust than we're seeing right now with it close to 12 million. All right, hope that makes sense.
Brilliant, Don. I love it. These are strategies. If you don't know, you don't know. That's it. Amazing. This is why the wealthy use these kind of strategies. It's amazing. Absolutely, it is. Brilliant. Okay. Were there any other quick questions oh. that we can answer for lunchtime? Hope this has been helpful. Um, irrevocable trusts and per diem is all we got to. There's so many questions, and you're always invited to call the hotline. It's 800-276-1430, or attend one of our summits. We've got one coming up April 22nd. 23rd, 24th, it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday class. You would register at protectwealth.com. We're so excited. And a webinar on Tuesday with Scott Estel. This would be a good one. Ooh, that would be really good. So next Tuesday, Scott Estel will be talking last-minute tax tips before you file your tax return. Remember, the tax deadline has been extended from April 15th to May 17th, so you have an extra month and two days. That's good, but but before you file, you ought to be listening to that webinar with Scott Estel. We're really excited to have him on. Anyway, with that, um, I hope you have a great lunch um, and make it a great day. Thanks.